All right, class, let's play a hypothetical. Let's say you could have your dream house. You could have anything you want in your house. What kinds of things would you have? Oh, let's see. Um, bowling alley, movie theater, jet skis, uh, castle tower, library, real working lightsaber, the DeLorean from Back to the Future, full basketball court, full football field, and some tennis courts too. Golf simulator, weight room. Yeah, I think that's good. Literally none of those things are realistic, but I guess that's why we call it a dream house. Anyways, today we're going to talk about somebody who had probably the biggest dream house of all time, the Palace of Versailles. We're going to talk about why that person had that and what allowed him to have so much power. Let's go. Hey, what's going on, everybody? You ever play that game growing up called Simon Says? I'm sure you did at some point, whether in gym class or grades. You know that classic game where one student is given unprecedented power to make the class do whatever they want? Well, assuming they say Simon Says before they actually ask the class to do something. Yeah, that game's kind of crazy when you think about it because a lot of students would probably go nuts with that. It's dangerous. I know I personally probably wouldn't want to give one student all of that. But Simon Says in a lot of ways is the perfect metaphor for how European monarchs ruled during this time period. From about the 1400s to all the way into the 1700s, rulers in Europe were considered to be absolute. Absolutism means a ruler has complete and total power over everything in their state. Now we've seen this before with emperors and kings before where they have complete and total power, but this is a little bit different. There is nothing holding these rulers back and there's a lot of different examples. But all of these rulers in Europe believed that they had something called divine right, that God had selected them to rule, similar to things that we saw like in ancient Egypt and China where the, there were these beliefs and things like the mandate of heaven, that the gods had selected somebody to rule. This is just the Christian version, that God had ordained kings and emperors to rule. Understand, if everyone believes that God had selected this person, no one's going to challenge them. And so this period is going to have an unprecedented amount of political, cultural, social power given to one person in a lot of different states. And there's a number of different examples. Today we're going to focus on two, Spain and France. Now let's start with Spain. We've already talked about some of the things going on in the background here with Spain and their pursuits in regards to exploration. That's all going on at this time. But at the same time, some other things change after the rule of Ferdinand and Isabella. In fact, the new king of Spain, Charles V, isn't actually exactly Spanish. There's a lot of intermarrying that happens in medieval Europe, and the result is that Charles V, the new king, you can recognize him by his uh, chin there. Yeah, that's a trait that the Habsburg family that Charles V is from, unfortunately, has. I think you know why. Being one of the Habsburgs, Charles actually is born as the heir not only to Spain, but also to the Holy Roman Empire. So he simultaneously rules two countries at once. It's an unprecedented amount of power that he has as a result. Now you might also remember Charles V from a few videos ago when we talked about the events of the Lutheran Reformation, because he's the Holy Roman Emperor at the time of Martin Luther. That's the guy who Martin Luther straight up defied at the Diet of Worms. Now Charles V solidifies his power through a major military victory, defeating the Ottomans at the city of Vienna, who were led by Suleiman the Magnificent. This is another one of these examples where Europe was protected from Ottoman invasion or Muslim invasion, preserving the Holy Roman Empire. But naturally, all of this power that Charles wielded, it, it took a toll on him. Not to mention he grew a nice beard to cover up his crazy chin. Um, he also actually was kind of driven insane and moved to an island and became a monk and died shortly after. Charles is certainly one example of Spanish absolutism, but the best example is a later ruler. His name is Philip II. Philip II definitely believed in divine right, so much so to the point that he believed that he was the defender of the Catholic Church, that God had chosen him to do that. And we see some early success for him in that endeavor in 1571, when he again defeats the Ottomans at the Battle of Lepanto once again preserving the Spanish Empire. Because he believed he was the defender of the Catholic Church though, Philip believed that any Protestant, any one of these religious denominations or even countries that had broken away during the Reformation, they were enemies of the Catholic Church and therefore the enemies of Spain. So his biggest enemy at this time was England. England was newly Protestant as we discussed under the reign of Henry VIII who you know started his own church so he could divorce his wife, you remember that whole thing. We'll unpack more about England in our next video and what was happening with absolutism there. But now Henry's daughter, Elizabeth I, is Queen of England. 
And she really didn't do any favors for herself in her relationship with Spain. She kind of poked the bear by sending one Francis Drake to pirate different Spanish routes and colonies in the New World. Philip responded by doing something unprecedented. He created a massive fleet of 130 ships famously called the Spanish Armada with the intent of crossing the English Channel and invading and destroying England. When the Armada traveled across the channel in 1588, however, it was hit with a massive storm. The storm left the Spanish Armada in shambles, and this allowed the English Navy to destroy what was left. Now, for the English, this was a major victory. In fact, they believed it was a miracle from God. It's where we get the phrase, God save the queen and it left Philip very humiliated, maybe even questioning whether or not he was chosen by God. The fall of the Spanish Armada also signals a decline in Spanish power. Spain will never be as great as it was at this point. Now, it still has some of its colonies, but it's gonna start to dwindle. Spain experienced a, a period of unprecedented growth. And this wasn't just a military economic thing. Spain flourished academically. One example is the famous artist El Greco, the Greek, who was a Greek guy living in Spain who produced sort of the Spanish Renaissance art. Or the famous author Miguel Cervantes, who wrote the famous story of Don Quixote, you know, the old man who thought he was a knight and actually wasn't and ends up attacking windmills and stuff like that. It's a great read, better in Spanish. Spain's fall, however, will signal the rise of a new power. That's France. France might even be the height of absolute power at this time, and it's all because of one guy. But before we get to that guy, we gotta catch up with some of the things that are going on in France. Much like the rest of Europe, France has some decisions to make about how they're gonna approach the changes going on as a result of the Reformation. Many people in France have become Protestants because John Calvin, the leader of the Calvinist movement, was in fact French. Yet traditionally, France has also been very Catholic. And so there was sort of a jockeying of position between French Catholics, the traditionalists, and the Huguenots, the French Protestants. Protestants. In the 1570s, it seemed like France was becoming more Protestant. The Huguenots were gaining power. Now, some of this was because of a noble named Henry of Navarre who was marrying into the royal family. Henry was going to become Henry IV, the King of France. But many of the French traditional Catholics did not like this. So at the royal wedding on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572, a mob of Catholics will kill 3,000 French Huguenots at the royal wedding. This is known as St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And it just shows the intensity of these wars of religion that were happening in France. There's more to it, but that's really the highlight. Now, Henry of Navarre does become king. He becomes Henry IV, and one of his first acts is to pass something called the Edict of Nantes. This granted religious toleration to his fellow Huguenots. Now, it's safe to say the Huguenots loved Henry, but the Catholics didn't, which is why eventually Henry was assassinated. This left a major vacancy in 1610, with the only person ready to take over was a nine-year-old. That's right, nine-year-old Louis XIII was the next in line to be king. Now, I don't know how many of you have nine-year-olds in your life, maybe a sibling or something like that, but I wouldn't trust a nine-year-old with anything. You're now giving a nine-year-old divine right absolute power. It's a recipe for disaster. It's not going to work, which is why he actually didn't really do anything. It was the French Cardinal Richelieu who ruled as his advisor and actually pulled all the strings. Now, Richelieu is probably most famous for being the villain in the book The Three Musketeers and all the different movie iterations, but he's more famous for truly extending royal power and giving even more absolute power to Louis XIII in the process, and more importantly, Louis XIII's eventual son, Louis XIV. No, he didn't have him when he was nine years old. I'm talking down the line. But ironically, when Louis XIV takes over, I know, I know, it's a lot of Louis, buckle up, it's France, they name everybody Louis. Louis XIV takes over at the age of five, and it's the same situation. We have another cardinal, this time Cardinal Mazarin, who sort of leads him to power. But Louis XIV is the one who will bring France to world power status during his reign. Louis XIV is the prime example of what happens when absolute power goes to one's head. And it's no surprise that this happens. You give somebody a lot of power, they're going to overuse. Like when I go to the Pizza Ranch buffet, I have the power to eat all sorts of chicken, mashed potatoes, and pizza. That power is going to go to my head and I'm going to regret it later. It's just a fact. But Louis is even more extreme. You see, he believed that he was the sun god. He believed he was a reincarnated Apollo, so he referred to himself as the sun king. Louis doesn't believe he's just a king. He believes that he is a god and he wants to be treated as such. He famously said, l'état c'est moi, which means the state is me or I am the state. He believed he was everything for France and the people bought into it too. Remember that whole estates general thing that was set up to make sure a French ruler never had too much power? Louis figured out a way around it. Just pretend that it doesn't exist. Louis would also build up the largest army in all of Europe, and he would also begin to continue colonization efforts that were already taking place, making France rich. And all of these riches would be spent on himself. Since Louis was a god, he needed a palace that was fit for a god. 
Enter the Palace of Versailles. That's that dream home I was referencing before. There's never been anything like it. For one, it's huge, but it's just so ornately decorated. All sorts of Renaissance and Baroque style paintings. All sorts of Renaissance and Baroque style paintings. If it ain't Baroque, don't fix it. <laughs> Massive statues, mirrors all over the place. It was all meant to create this fancy atmosphere that truly reflected the godlike status of Louis. In fact, with all of the mirrors and windows, it was meant to create all this light that almost made it feel like you were in heaven. It's one thing to dream about what you could have in a house. It's another thing to literally be able to have anything you want. And that just shows the level of power and influence that Louis had. Now, it wasn't just the house. Louis also had these weird rituals and things that treated him like he was a god. And people just wanted to be a part of them. I mean, he had one where it was basically this wake-up ceremony where everyone would help him get dressed in the morning. And he would wake up to dramatic music and light. Pretty much how I wake up at home every day. Louis was also smart in why he built Versailles. It was meant to be this place of parties in excess that all of the rich nobles in France would want to go to. Therefore, they would be there partying and they wouldn't be focusing on anything else and Louis could do whatever he wanted to. So the Hall of Mirrors would be this place full of dancing and balls and all this crazy excess that people would want to be a part of. All of this shows the power that Louis has and he does make an alliance with Spain to go against England. You sort of have that Catholic Brotherhood here. But really it all comes down to something called the balance of power. As all these different absolute rulers are rising to power, there's a battle for who is the best and who has the most power in Europe. And if one country gets too powerful, the rest tend to team up to try to bring that equality back. And that's a theme we're gonna to continue to see again and again. France and Spain are just two examples of absolutism. We're gonna look at some other ones down the line and continue to talk about what happens when there's really not enough power to go around. But that's a story for another day. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.